And welcome everyone to Showbiz India Chat. And we are continuing our discussion about the farmers' protest in India, which has still not come to any kind of resolution. And I'd like to welcome back our panelists, Mr. Namneet Chuk, Pallavi Alwalia, Kimi Varma, and welcome for the first time, Dr. Rajwan Singh. And now I'd like to go right into our chat. Last time we had quite a bit of people reacting to it, which, by the way, we absolutely encourage. Please have an open dialogue. Feel free to comment right here on our YouTube channel. But let's start with something that you know has kind of bothered me. That we were called that we are liars. We're not giving the right information to people. So I'll start with you, Namneet. What exactly is the farmers' protest in simple terms? In simple terms, Reshma, the protest is around uh, sale and pricing and storage of the agricultural farm produce. Uh, what the government is saying is that so far in 70 years, there is a mandi system, the wholesale market, which is controlled by large producers and friends and agents and all the small farmers sell all the produce at the mandis, at the wholesale market. The government is saying that it's difficult for us to monitor it and there's a lot of agents in the middle that make money and the farmers don't get all the money they deserve and there's politics and the big people get favored because they put people on committees and so the government wants to install some free market uh, systems into the agricultural world and the government is saying that we for so long have offered you minimum pricing we would like to get away from that because we buy all this merchandise and then we don't know what to do with it at times so we'd like private corporate players to come in and buy the merchandise and storage the government so far has told people not to store for a variety of reasons i think what's happened is in the 60s there was shortage of food in india and so these laws were put in place and they're no longer relevant Dr. Rajmant, I'd like to take it uh, for you now. What do you think of this law? Well, I, I feel that uh, the government, the way it was uh, enacted and the whole process was not, uh, it doesn't seem like a very legitimate process from the uh, point of view of the farmers. They, was, they are the main stakeholders. They were never brought into discussions. There, there was no representation of any of the Kisan uh, unions to participate in a dialogue or give their feedback or their input. And even what we are understanding, even the opposition was not also given the chance to critique the process. I come from a, another angle. Uh, I'm part of a, an initiative called EcoSIC. And what we feel is that this whole, if we open this entire farming business to uh, free market and corporations, uh, there is a, a, a environmental cost to this also, because as we now know, even in the United States, there is a huge movement that people encourage that if you want to not contribute towards climate crisis, we need to buy locally grown food rather than these corporations you know, reducing. And then there's a storage cost and there's a climate cost to that. And then you're transporting all of this uh, produced uh, to the consumer. So from my angle, I feel that they, there could be a, a way to handle where the farmers' uh, interests are also taken care of while we are encouraging the free market uh, practices. So the word MSP keeps coming up again and again, Pallavi. Uh, we talked about this last time. You shed some light. People are saying, they've commented that, in fact, people, farmers will be getting MSP. Uh, is that true or not true? So the MSP, which is the minimum support price, has been a benchmark or a custom. It's actually, it was not even written in the 1955 law. So it was it was something that was customary that was being followed. And um, I think when they uh, when the government at this time with the ordinance that they first passed in June of 2019 and then passed it through the parliament in uh, September of this year, um, it was not written into the law this time around. It's been offered. It's been offered in negotiation uh, to them that they will guarantee those prices. And there was a point, uh, and I'm, I was just following on what's going on in terms of their negotiations. There was a time where the farmers were willing to accept that uh, it was going to be called a written guarantee, right? But it was, again, not coming into the law because it was not even in the law before. But at this point, I think they've kind of walked away from that. And uh, the 
they're not even dealing with uh, MSPs anymore. The farmers aren't, uh, though it has been part of the government's offer. So your to your point, um, um, there's a much talk about it, but I think that was a stalling point for the farmers beginning out. And let's talk about the human rights issue about this. Kimmy, I know you've been very vocal about the human rights violation issue. I really feel like the amount of deaths that are happening in Delhi right now and the amount of suffering that people are going through, I think it's it's a it's a basic duty of any human rights um, organization or a country that supports human rights to kind of not let its citizens suffer like this and now here people say oh farmers are there because they want to be there they're they're protesting protesting is a right but at the same time why can't we have the government be uh, compassionate enough to figure out a way that you know they can let this protest happen, but still not have people suffer like this. So, Namit, in your opinion, is this law that is being passed correct or incorrect? Does it harm anybody? You know, uh, there's 500 million workers in India and 250 million of them are in agriculture. 50% of the em- entire employment of India is in agriculture. In United States, for a reference point of view, only 3% of the employment is in agriculture. So over a period of time, uh, when the father dies, the farm is divided up at times into two or three sons or son-in-laws. And over a period of time, the farms have become very small. And uh, because they're small, there isn't a lot of income. And so a lot of technology doesn't come in. And so, for instance, the stubble burning The reasons the farmers burn the stubble is because it's the easiest, fastest, cheapest way to clean up the land for the next harvest. Does the government offer any solution? Does the government offer them a cleaner, more hygienic, a better way to dispose of the stubble? They don't. Um, And uh, the, the right way of doing it is to use tractors and other equipment to dig up the earth and remove the stubble, but a majority of the farmers can't afford this. So there's a perpetual agrarian distress in India. I think part of the government's bill is to address these issues, but I think the way, like Dr. Rajwan Singh said, it was enacted in the middle of a chaos. Uh, A voice vote was called, not even a physical ballot. So we don't even know if the bill passed or not. The biggest issue is A country of 1.3 billion people, I don't think New Delhi should dictate what happens in agriculture in a small piece of land or a county or a district or a city thousands of miles away. That needs to stop. Yes, you you mentioned that last time too. So how does one get that to stop? How do we get the states more power and more rights? So because of the agrarian distress, because of all of these issues, So the farmers are wondering if the Monday system is taken away and the corporate players come in, maybe the corporate players will actually give them a better price. But the farmers are afraid that after the corporate players give them a better price, the government will stop the Monday system. And then the corporate players will start abusing the farmers. And then slowly they'll start to own the farmers and own the land and put liens on the land. So what is the right system? I, I don't think anybody in the planet really knows. Is it Monday system? It should be absolutely free market capitalism in agriculture in India. So since no one knows what the right system is, I think the best system is to let people in a small town, a small village, a city, a district in India decide what works for them. And what will happen is there's 700 districts in India. And if there are 700 different ways of dealing with agriculture, the right ways will start to shine. I think we all would agree here that uh, deregulation is the right goal for any country where, you know, the governments don't interfere in the running of, uh, you know, the private, uh, uh, you know, way of doing things, whether it's corporate or individual. So we want less uh, interference from the government. However, in India, you have to understand this is aspirational. 
you know, deregulation is aspirational because uh, everyone in India, especially with the farmers uh, struggling, and we've heard of these suicides and all of that, that are not recent. These are from like four years back, five years back, right? So they've been in debt, they've been in pr under pressure, and they've not been able to cope. They have been asking for reforms, but the reforms could not be, okay, go, uh, we're going to throw you in this big pond, go swim. Right. We don't know how to swim, but you'll figure it out because deregulation in principle is great for our country. I would say that somebody has to walk them over the threshold of the deregulation. There are many different methodologies through which we can make farming sustainable because 80 percent of the farmers in India are small landholders, like two acres to three acres or five acres at the max. And the, the system has to be developed not exactly the way West operates, but it has to be India specific formula where we have a mixture of uh, deregulation, but at the same time of uh, uh, some sort of a regulations where the, there is a, a safety net for these small farmers. For example, we, we all love amul butter, but do you all know that amul butter is a cooperative? It is not, it's, it's a lot of farmers are, uh, brought into this whole operation, and it's a very successful model. So uh, even MarkFed in Punjab is also a government-supported uh, initiative through which the farmers are contributing and they're benefiting. So there are many different ways this can be strengthened. You know, I was talking to some of the farmers here in, uh, in the United States. Most of the farmers in U.S. are not small farm, uh, small landholders. They have, uh, you know, a lot of acreage on, on which they do their farming. And so they have a more negotiating power. And secondly, <clears throat> a lot of these states have their own agriculture boards. And on these boards, they have farmers sitting and they, are, they have their very active input on the pricing on many various issues affecting the farming. Third, there has to be a way of farmers also make, uh, brought into the decision-making process. I also think that as a government, I don't care which political party, I'm not attached to any party in that country, but whoever is a government, shouldn't they be creating infrastructure for better farming, for better things, rather than washing their hands off and just saying that, okay, let corporates take care of it. And uh, Kimmy, uh, I'd like to point out at this point that, you know, we are a very diverse panel here. Of course, each one of you are eminent members of the Sikh community and the Indian diaspora, but Kimmy has family who are, a lot of them are farmers. Mm -hmm. And so from their perspective, what do they, what do they feel? You know? They totally stand with the farmers because I come from a farming family. My family is still in farming in Punjab and in Canada. I mean, everywhere. They are real farmers. I know people feel like I'm lying, but come on. So they are farmers. And uh, they also feel that these are not, this is not a good way to try to regulate the market. What should these farmers do? So one is they need to press on Chandigarh and the chief minister of Punjab and chief minister of- Or Haraya. other states, of other states. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And fine, Punjab wants to take a lead because Punjab produces 12% of India's agriculture. Okay, great, take the lead, but other states need to join in. It's a larger issue. Uh, and we need to press for a constitutional amendment so that the states have power. Then uh, what should the farmers do? They should, they're having issues with sale, pricing and storage. And I think the farmers uh, deep down want the storage to be unlimited. But that's an easy one to tackle. On the storage, uh, Navneet, uh, the, the thing is a small farmer who has like four or five acres of land, the first thing they want to do is as soon as the crop is cut, they want to sell it and take the money. They don't have the capital. They don't have the money to hold those or store the crop and wait for the prices to go up and then sell it. A small farmer cannot store. He barely lives in a small house. True. But the farmers want um, some mechanism of storage, whether it's their own or someone warehouse depot in their town. And, but, but the past laws didn't allow farmers to store at all. And now they want to change the law because they want to allow corporates to be able to store. Yeah. So it looks like that the law which is being changed will be favoring the corporates and not the small farmer. Let's say the five of us are farmers, right? 
and somebody grows almonds and somebody grows cauliflower and somebody grows wheat after we buy a land we put in the seeds and we put fertilizer and water and then we harvest and now we have the produce in our hand what do we want done with the produce sell the produce sell it and get the money and buy new seeds right and for the crop so how where do we sell it to see if i'm a small farmer definitely to the mandi because that guy is going to pay me the very next day and now i don't have to worry about you know if i'm sending to a corporate the corporate the head of the corporate is in mumbai so it's like if i'm not getting paid and this is how what the farmers were saying that if they're not getting paid and then who will they complain to who do they go to yeah. they tell the guy who works in the county like in the city, in the town and then the guy will say oh, you know i'm just a, a worker who who is there 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 are dispute so, resolution yeah. mechanisms set up in this rule though no they're not it says that they have to go to the sdm which is the sdm is so like there's you know, a, like there's a conciliation there. board okay and then after the conciliation board of course it's administrative it's not a judicial uh, review well, and but here is a problem our judicial tree is messed up in india right look at how many cases that are pending so they are not fast so what the government's view is and i'm just saying it it's a perspective um, and that view is we put in an administrative review here for y'all okay which is the conciliation board then the sdm then the adc or the dc right but their decisions have the force of a court decision okay that's what they're saying And so maybe if you had to if you had to sell your legal services like this to go to a mandi and then do this and do that and then have a dispute resolution board for you to sell your I would represent the farmer I would still be a lawyer that would be doing my part to, but for you to sell your legal services you had to go to a mandi to find clients and then there's a dispute resolution board this is kind of silly right why why is it all of this going on if i'm a yeah. farmer if i have one i should be able to sell to anyone anywhere right but i, I want to find the best price correct yeah, so I'm which means free market say i have 1 million pounds of gobi do you want it and what price are you going to give me and i go sell it to that person right so in this whole mandi business it's working but there's so much favoritism and so many agents involved and that's part of the reason uh why the government wants to help the farmers to get out of this mandi system all the government needs to do is say okay fine we we'll let the let's do it this way in. but we, for small players who don't have the phone number of the corporate player we have a mandi for you so you can go sell it there if you want i but, think it needs to be walked over carefully and once it's walked over the other side may not be a bad side to be on it's just that it's unknown right now you know and the other thing is palavi that all these kind of the you know the missing apmc all those things have happened in bihar and madhya pradesh bihar yeah. sure and look at the state the 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 condition bihar is in and look at the condition the bihar farmer is in they don't make any money in fact the farmer owns 4 acres of land he comes to our farm in punjab to do the farming on a to do the hardy like you know the daily wage because he's saying he doesn't make any money so then how like i i, I cannot understand like who whose example are they following like where was it successful so, like in this world in fact where was it successful yeah to this point kimi i don't think even the present model is the perfect one as oh, you are oh, saying right I because it's giving not. everyone a lot of grief yeah. yeah right mm-hmm. and so a uh, reform is in order but with some guarantees to them so that they won't be just let down by the big guy oh thank you again everyone uh for your time and <laughs> your effort again i want to reiterate we are not a politically motivated panel we just want to shed our light and our perspective and we can all have different perspectives on this topic in hopes to shed light on the subject for everyone else and you feel free to talk about your perspective here too as a matter of fact we love to hear from you thank you again bye bye thank bye. you subscribe to showbiz india's youtube channel and be sure to click on that bell icon for instant notifications